you for giving me this opportunity to share with you some insights into some of these really exciting advances in science and discuss also some of the concerns they raise and how one might be able to regulate this so that things don't go wrong. You're all aware that Chinese scientists did some things that we all believe should not have happened. They would not have happened here. I'd be happy to discuss why that wouldn't be possible. Um, but we need to ensure that uh, that sort of thing is prevented by future regulations. So we'll discuss a bit about science, a bit about potential and current activities in applying that science to human health, and also the issues of how does one regulate this? What are the concerns? What should we be worrying about? What should we not be worrying about? <clears throat> and how are we going to make sure things are carried out appropriately? That's true for stem cells as well as for genome editing. I'm not going to talk about stem cells today, although it's not so distantly um, related. So I will mention stem cells because it comes up in this context as well. So um, let's see. I don't have a pointer. Apparently it doesn't work on that screen. So I'll try and do this with the cursor or I'll just point. So. So these are the questions I, I think would be worth addressing today, not just by me. I'd like to hear from you and happy to answer questions. I've only got about 15 slides, so I'll leave time for open discussion. If you have a pressing point while I'm talking, interrupt. I don't mind. So, so first I'm going to tell you what it is. Ah, perfect. No, I'll try not to. So. <laughs> so first I'm going to talk about what it is exactly so that... Uh, that we're all on the same page. Some of you may know this quite well, others maybe not. What can we do? What can it be used for? What is it being used for? What could become possible? Isn't yet, but could be, and probably will be in the next few years. And then if we think about what we could do, which of those things should we do and which of them should we not do? That's a debate, and people have differences of opinion about that, and we have to resolve those and come to a societal conclusion as to what should be allowed and what not, and the concerns that that raises, and how it should be regulated, as, as I said. So what is it, first off? How do, uh, how do we, what do we mean when we say genome editing? So this is a recently discovered me method for doing this, but it's not that that wasn't being done before. It's just much better. So the way in which this is, what's, what's necessary is to identify a specific place in the three billion base pairs that make up our genome, target an intervention to a specific place. I'll tell you how that's done in a minute. And then make a change. So it's basically like editing in, in Microsoft Word or whatever you use. You go and you find the place you want to change, you make Make a, you, let's say you make a deletion and you put in something else. That's very similar to what we're doing in the genome, where it's just a string of A's and T's and G's and C's, but it's the same idea, because in fact, although there are only four letters to that alphabet, it encodes all sorts of different things, like genes that make proteins, genes that make RNA, regulatory sequences that determine whether those genes are on or off, or how much they're on if they're on, that sort of thing. So you can think of the genome as an encyclopedia with 23 different volumes, 23 chromosomes. We have two copies, 46. So there are two editions of the genome in each of your cells. And each of those cells, each of those uh, volumes, 23 chromosomes in each half of your genome, you can think of as being made up of chapters and sentences and words. It's really a pretty good analogy. Some of that you may all be aware of, but just want to make that clear. So this blue and purple bit here is CRISPR-Cas. And it came from bacteria, was worked out over some years beforehand, but it was turned into a gene editing tool in 2012. So everything that's happened has happened in that time window, very short time window. It's moved incredibly fast because it's such a good tool. So the way it works, the purple bit there is RNA. And that's what targets it to a specific place in the genome. Because by base pairing, the, the red sequences are DNA, 
two copies, complementary. The RNA in this complex of the blue protein and the purple RNA, CRISPR is the RNA, Cas9 is the protein, targets it to a particular place. And the RNA recognizes that space there, 22 base pair long sequence, and binds. So that's where the selectivity comes from. We'll come back to that. Then the protein has two enzymatic activities that clip the DNA on both strands. So it makes a cut in a specific place defined by the sequence of the RNA. And then the cell has mechanisms for repairing damage like a cut. And it repairs it. And that, that, I don't want to get into the details of that because it's complicated. But there are several ways in which the cell can do that. And scientists take advantage of those ways to manipulate exactly what gets changed. If you just let the cell do it without any help, it tends to put the two bits together again, but make mistakes. So that basically kills the gene, makes a mutation in it, knocks it out. That, is, that you often want to do. But if you want to change the gene, edit rather than delete, then you need some other way of inserting, let's say you want to insert this bit of, this word of green, in there, there's another mechanism for doing that, which isn't as efficient, but you can make it work. So that's basically what works. I'd, I'm happy to go into more detail if anybody wants, but that should be enough for you to understand the rest of what I'm going to say, but if not, interrupt. So you can do this in any cell. You can do it in plants, you can do it in bacteria, you can do it in humans, you can do it in mice, you can do it in fish. Essentially, we're all encoded by DNA, system works everywhere. And it's pretty simple. It's not difficult to buy a piece of RNA. You just send the sequence to some company, they send you back the RNA, you combine it with the protein, put it in the cell, and it'll make an edit. You have to sort out among the different edits it can make, and we'll come back to that. But you know what you want to do. And you can usually make it happen. Okay, now, what can you do with that? So uh, that means it's versatile. You can do this almost anywhere in the genome. So you can edit any piece of those encyclopedias. It's fast. It's accurate because this recognition is very good. And it's cheap because RNA is fairly cheap to make. You can phone up and get it, email and get it. Uh, we do it all the time. We all use this now in, in basic biological research. There are a few labs that don't make use of it because it's such a good tool. I've talked about deleting or adding. You can also manipulate not the body of the gene that let's say encodes a protein like hemoglobin, which I'll come back to when we talk about sickle cell disease, but you can also edit the, the punctuation that says this gene should be on or not. And so you can turn genes on and off you can also make single base changes. There's some modifications of this that don't involve cutting the DNA. The targeting's the same, but these cutting devices have been inactivated, so it just goes and sits there. And then you can attach something else to the blue protein and have it make a different change to the chromosome. And you can turn genes on and off that way as well. Or you can make a single base substitution. You can turn an A into a T or an A into a C. Uh, you can do almost all those base changes now, just over the last three years, something like that. So you can really do pinpoint editing. And you don't do a DNA cut with the potential problems that can raise. So sometimes you get mistakes. Those are called off-target edits. Maybe the, the RNA recognizes something that's a little bit similar, but not identical, and it goes and targets the wrong place. That can happen. The techniques have been improved massively over the past decade, or less. And they're now down at the level that you can't really distinguish the mistakes from the background level of mutation. So every time one of your cells divides, it makes one or two mistakes. And those are carried forward as, as mutations. So all your cells, although they started off with the same genomes, they diverge. Not a lot, but a bit. And this doesn't make any more mistakes than that. 
So it's now very difficult to distinguish mistakes made by the tools from mistakes made by the cell. And that, that's, that's good. So off-target events <coughs> are rare. They can be monitored. I'll tell you about that. They're not a huge problem. We thought they would be three, four years ago if I'd given this talk. I said, that's a big problem. Now we don't think it is a big problem. It's something to watch. OK, so this is sort of an evolution from scissors to Swiss army knives. Used to be able to do one thing, cut the DNA. Now we can do multiple things, depending on what we attach to that protein. We can make modifications. We can change the, the, the proteins in the chromosomes instead of the DNA. We can change single bases. So it's a very versatile tool, getting more versatile every, every few months, literally every few months. So. so that's a powerful tool, and that's why we're all using it. I mean, people in my lab use it every week to make changes, not in people's genes. We don't do that, but in mouse genes and sometimes in fish genes to do basic biological research. But that's not conceptually different from what's been going on ever since molecular biology started in the 70s, or a bit earlier probably in bacteria. So th this has been well worked out for, for laboratory research. So I'm not going to talk about that anymore unless somebody has questions. The issues about human genome editing come up in several contexts. You can edit cells of your body, some patient's body, blood cells, liver cells, muscle cells. <clears throat> um, why would you want to do that? People have genetic mutations that lead them to have defects in those various cell types, which you can go in and correct using CRISPR-Cas9. And that's called somatic editing. Somatic means body, not, in, not heritable tissue. That's also basically just a, a more modern version of what you've heard of for many years as gene therapy. This is much better, faster, cheaper, simpler, more accurate, and it's, it's replacing standard gene therapy techniques and the earlier genome editing techniques, which I won't take the time to go through. It's, there are, some of those are already in the clinic, using similar ideas, but different tools. Germline cells are eggs and sperm and, and uh, embryos, which lead to heritable changes. If you make a change in those cells, it can be inherited by the next generation. I'll come back to that. That's where most of the controversy lies. Finally, you can do this in stem cells. I said I was going to mention stem cells. Stem cells are cells, you have lots of them, they maintain your blood. You make blood cells all the time. You replace your red cells every 120 days. You replace your platelets every six days. You replace your skin all the time. You replace the lining of your gut every few days. That's all done by stem cells, which know they're supposed to be gut or blood or muscle. But they're sort of sitting there waiting to be called upon if there's some need to replace or repair. So stem cells do two things. They make more of themselves so the supply doesn't run out, and they can differentiate into lots of different things, depending on which sort of stem cell they are. Now, you've all heard of human embryonic stem cells. They come from early embryos, and they can make almost anything because they're early on in development. They have multiple potential. And there is also a later version of that developed initially by Yamanaka in Japan, who found a way of taking any cell, pretty much now, of your body and converting it into a pluripotent stem cell. Those are called induced pluripotent stem cells, IPS. So these are, these are cells that people are using to generate tissues for regeneration and repair, which they then implant in. All sorts of different ways, but now mostly CRISPR-Cas. So this, why is this important in laboratory research? It's important because it allows us to understand how things work much better, because we can manipulate them. And as I said, everybody's doing that. But it's also important for understanding things like immunity. Why do some people have autoimmune diseases? Why do others not? How does immunity actually work? 
What about human fertility? How do you develop sperm? You know, some people are not very fertile. Why is that? Can we work out using spermatogonial stem cells what's wrong with those and, and perhaps fix it if we understood it well? So there's a lot of research, well, I'll come back to in a bit, about uh, studying early development in humans, which has lots of health implications, mostly good, some potentially of concern. We can figure out which genes do what. So if you've got a disease like um, sickle cell disease, we know exactly what the mutation is. It's a single base change. We've known that for a long time. But there are lots of genetic diseases, thousands. And we are beginning now to understand which of them do what. And there's a set of ways of looking for genes that are associated with diseases, statistically. And there are dozens to hundreds of genes for many different diseases. We don't know what they do in many cases. This is a tool for finding out what they do, in mouse models, for example. And then there's examples for treating diseases. So this isn't particularly controversial when done in basic laboratory research. It's well regulated. What if you want to do it for therapy? What if somebody has something wrong with their blood? Sickle cell disease. Or with their epithelium, cystic fibrosis, or their muscles, muscular dystrophy. Could you use this technology to fix some of those diseases? Well, some of them it's easier than others. Sickle cell disease, in principle, should be easy. It's a single base change. You can make that change back again. So you're going back to exactly the normal gene. You're not doing anything out of the ordinary. If you can take somebody's blood stem cells out, engineer them to correct the defect, give them back in a bone marrow transplant, you can cure a kid. In principle, you can cure a child of, of uh, sickle cell disease. And in fact, if, no, that... Let's leave it there. You can cure a child of sickle cell disease. This is not heritable, right? Because you're editing their blood stem cells. They won't make everything else. They won't make an embryo. Similarly for muscular dystrophy, which is harder, there are ways of doing that with muscle stem cells. Cystic fibrosis is harder still, so I'm not going to go there unless somebody wants to talk about that because it's complicated. So there are two ways of doing this. One, you take these tools... The RNA, you're targeting something, and the protein to do the job. And you inject them into the circulation, and they go and do their job. Now, that works for some things. It works for liver, because if you put things into the circulation, the first place they go is liver. And so many targeting things to liver, they're restricted to liver just by, if you like, the plumbing and the way the body works. And so you can put them in there without specifically doing anything to make sure they go there and nowhere else. So you can edit liver diseases. Oh, I put it up here. I put it here. You can, you can where is it? You can edit them for hemophilia. Factor eight, blood pro clotting proteins made by the liver. So people with a factor eight deficiency could be fixed by editing. And people are working on that. It's not there yet. You can do things for muscular dystrophy, as I already said. The trouble with doing it this way, it's, it's hard to check you did it right and that you didn't make mistakes because it's in the whole body. The other way to do it, which is generally speaking preferred, but this does work, is to remove the cells from the, the patient, culture them, edit them, check that you did it right, and then put them back. That works very well for stem cells because they can proliferate and make more of themselves. You can study them when they're in vitro, make sure you did it right. You can have a clone of stem cells so you know what its sequence has changed, and you can put it back in again. That works very well for blood cells. It works well for sickle cell disease, for thalassemias, which is another hemoglobin disorder. And it works well for treating a patient with HIV. It's not the only way to treat a patient with HIV, but the virus needs receptors to get into the cell. And if a patient has HIV, you can engineer their T cells, which is lymphocytes, remove the receptor so they no longer get infected, so the disease can be tamped down or almost eliminated. That has been tested out as in clinical trials. Cancer immunotherapy, you've probably heard about the fact that you can trick the immune system into fighting cancer. It's not exactly tricking it. It was trying, but the tumor cells shut it off. 
That's, that's what actually happens. And we, cancer biologists, are now trying to undo that shut off and get around the shutting off and use the immune system to kill cancers. It's working pretty well, not perfectly yet. Some of that, a lot of that is done using genome editing of the T cells. Those are T cells which will proliferate, you can put them back in and you can treat the patients. I mean, this, so you can do this with immune deficiency diseases. You've all heard of bubble boy syndrome where patients are immune deficient. You can fix their immune cells. In principle, some of these things, we know how to do it. It's still being worked out and in clinical trials, but there are an increasing number of clinical trials using this technology. So most people think that's a good thing. You're treating disease. Occasionally you're preventing disease, but mostly you're treating disease. So the risk of things going wrong and the benefit of things going right are balanced in the favor of benefit. It's, it's regulated by several different regulatory systems, including the FDA, and it's moving forward full speed. Well, not full speed, it's moving forward at speed. But what if you didn't just do what I said and take a gene and put it back to normal? So you know you're not making any new change, you're putting things back to where, if, if you like, they should be. In a, in a normal person who's not sick, doesn't have sickle cell disease or muscular dystrophy. That's treatment. What about making a change that makes somebody stronger, taller, blue-eyed rather than brown-eyed? Those sorts of things. That's called enhancement. All of those things are collectively called enhancement uh, on the assumption that they're all good. Um, it may not be the right word, but uh, that's what's used. It's actually very difficult to define the boundary. And you can think about this in, well, think about cosmetic surgery. A child with a hair lip, cosmetic surgery is a good thing. <coughs> Other sorts of cosmetic surgery, they're sort of benign. Are they a good thing? Some are probably not a good thing. So drawing the line about what's enhancement and what's treatment is not always very easy. It's true for human growth hormone. It's a good example from the early days of the recombinant DNA industry. Child, children with dwarfism, because they lack HGH, human growth hormone, can be treated by giving them recombinant human growth hormone. That's great. They become of normal stature. And then people started wondering, well, maybe I could become a basketball player if I took HGH. And people started abusing it. And it was used for things like slowing aging, which may or may not be true. And uh, in the end, Congress stepped in and said, you can't use HGH for anything except re restoring the stature of people who are short. So that's an example of where regulation had to step in to stop abuse, and it worked. HGH is doing a good job and it's not being abused because Congress made it illegal. So we have to think about that again when we're thinking about germline editing. At the moment, the risk-benefit ratio is not good for enhancements. So it's not going to be allowed. FDA would not approve it. I was going to talk about another issue, but I'm, I'm going to skip it because it's less important than some of the other things I want to say. So by and large, this is good. But as the risks are reduced, will it be so easy to say we shouldn't do enhancements? Is that the right thing to say? Maybe doing enhancements is not a bad idea. Fixing people's myopia or something like that, or color blindness. Color blindness you could think of as a treatment. But for that person, that's an enhancement. So that's going to have to be discussed continuously as we understand more. And I'm going to say this multiple times. We need public discussion and debate. And we're doing a number of things to try and promote that. And we need to do more. This has to be something that's discussed by the society as a whole. It's not something for scientists or politicians to regulate without consulting the public. Okay, the problem comes with germline editing. If you edit embryos, sperm, or oocytes, that's unfertilized eggs, um, then the, the mutation that you've made or the correction that you've made would be inherited by the offspring. So that raises some concerns. But in fact, there's a lot of germline editing that doesn't involve heritability. If you don't implant the edited embryo, but just study it, you can learn a lot. 
So there's a lot of what we call non-heritable germline editing that has a lot of value, and it's, it's well-regulated, along with other embryonic research. There are limitations on it. There are things you can't go beyond a certain stage, but you can learn a lot. And it's pretty well regulated by the existing systems. Why would one want to do that? People think, many scientists think, that you can study mice. You don't have to study human embryos, you can study mice. But in fact, that's not really true, because although they look the same at the blastocyst stage, which is when you put them back in after IVF, they don't look the same. This is still before implantation. The embryos are very different, and the genes that regulate them are different. Not very, but a bit. So that you can't learn about, and we don't know much about these later stages of human <coughs> development. This makes it possible to ad address those. In culture, no intention to implant. And you can also do the same thing with sperm and eggs. This is likely to yield significant improvements in IVF, fertility treatments, prevention of miscarriages, things like that. So the big problem is, what if, I, what if you're doing this heritably? Which is currently not allowed anywhere, including here. But as you know, it happened in China for two or three babies. Um, this can be done in animal species, and it's used a lot in mice and some other things. It's used in agricultural animals to improve you know, their, their meat or their milk or add things to plants to make them produce, let's say, vitamin A so that they can do, do be, be better food. So that's being done. Um, it can be done in animal species, but or not in all. And it can't yet be done in humans in any safe fashion. Um, so when the National Academy Committee considered this, they, their conclusion was, not now. You've got to meet a whole series of hurdles, which I'll come to at the end, before you can do that. And it raises a lot of ethical and social issues, quite apart from the safety ones. You know, Is there any off-target events? How do you know you haven't screwed things up in some other way? Again, we need a public discourse. And I just put this website up there. There's a lot more information on the Academy's website about gene editing. Off-target events, as I said earlier, and I'm going to go through this quickly because time is passing. That's an issue, but it's not what we thought was going to be a major issue. But there is another major issue. If you try and edit an embryo, and we know this from mice, and actually from some early experiments in human embryos in culture, it's hard to get every cell edited. So it depends on where you, when you do the editing. But in general, what you get is a mosaic embryo, where some cells in the embryo, let's say this is called the morula stage, 8 to 16 M cells, some of them have been edited in both copies of the gene, some in one copy of the gene, and some not at all. And that, that's OK with mice. For many of the experiments, it doesn't actually matter for the mice. But you wouldn't want to do it in a human. And this is a problem that we don't have a solution to right now, and I think it's going to be difficult. It says here that it's getting better. That's true. How much better is not at all clear. It's not clear to me personally. This is an opinion of mine, not necessarily the committee. I'm not sure this is going to be solved. I think this may preclude editing of human embryos. But there are other ways of going about this. You can edit the gametes, sperm or the eggs. And that can now be done in mice. You can take, in this case, sperm stem cells out of the testis or make them from pluripotent stem cells. You can culture them, grow them up, edit them, check that you did it right, put them back in the testes or culture them now to make sperm, fertilize an egg, and get a mouse. And that's been done in mice, rats, and monkeys. Not yet for humans. And it's been used to cure a, cater a genetically inherited cataract disease in mice. So you know you can do this with sperm cells with, in, in mammals. Similarly, you can do it with oocytes, although no editing yet. But you can grow them, primordial germ cells, from stem cells or from get them out of an embryo. So the blastocyst, you can take them out at this stage and make chloropotent stem cells. You can grow them up in culture. It's not easy, but you can. And you can get precursors to the oocytes. 
This is what you were when you started, about a tenth of a millimeter across. And that can then be fertilized, so it becomes a zygote, so unfertilized and fertilized egg without the jargon. Um, and that can then be implanted, well, cultured some more, and you can make lots of baby mice. This works quite well. Hasn't yet been used to correct any diseases, but it's setting the scene that this is going to be possible. It's already possible in mice. It's not possible in humans, but in principle, it should be feasible. So if, if germline editing happens, my prediction is this is the way it will happen. It wasn't the way her did it. So, so not yet, but in, within a few years. So I originally made this slide before her did his experiment. So it's not possible to say it cannot be done. <laughs> and he did it. So it's even less possible now. He shouldn't have done it. He, it's not clear how well he did it. It was a very irresponsible thing to do for many, many reasons, which we can go through. <clears throat> but there are reasons for doing it. There are thousands of genetic diseases, literally <coughs> five to 7,000, depending on who you ask. And that's five to 7% of the population is in a family where that's a genetic issue. So those people have a problem. What do they do? Do they forego having children? and adopt instead? Do they take the risk, which many people are willing to do, that the child will be okay, won't have inherited the disease? But there's a big burden to them for that. They can use prenatal, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, where you take one of those cells from a normal IVF and genotype it. Ask, does it have the mutation or not? If it does, you don't implant it. You pick the ones that don't. Works about 20% of the time, so it's not very efficient. A lot of people who try PGD don't get a baby. And there are situations where even this won't help you. I don't want to go through the genetics of it, but there are diseases like Huntington's disease, where if you have one copy of that mutant gene, you're going to get the disease, 100%, in your 40s. And it's a neurodegenerative disease, very nasty disease, and you can, if, if you do your genotyping at the beginning, you know you're going to get it. But one copy. So that means every child of, let's say, a father with Huntington's disease, since they're sexually mature long before they get the disease, every one of his children has a risk of getting that disease, 50% risk. And if, it's a, if he's a homozygote with the disease, all of them are going to get it. So do those people forego it? except they're going to live only that long a life with the disease, or they can't do this because you, every, every cell is going to have the, the mutation. There are other dominant diseases like that. There are not a lot of these people, but they're still people, and these are concerns. So is, is this a reason to do this? The problems are, obviously, you can imagine as well as I can, the genetic changes will be inherited. In the past, we used to say that was unacceptable. Well, that was because we couldn't do it. Now we probably can. And so it's a multi-generational benefit, but it's also a multi-generational risk if something goes wrong. You need long-term following up. There are people who are concerned about doing this for all sorts of ethical societal reasons. Is it the beginning of heading to designer babies? I think that's mostly rather very much exaggerated. People think you can make us smarter. I can think of lots of ways of making people s stupid by mutating them. I, we do not know how to make them smarter. So. Um, but is it a slippery slope towards things like that? Those are all arguments for which there are arguments on both sides. Perhaps the strongest one in many ways is this is going to be expensive. It will increase inequities. It, it won't be possible for everybody to do this. The concerns, which are not up there, but the concerns about changing the gene pool, the evolution of the species, are pretty out in left field. This is not going to be very common. So we're not going to change the gene pool in any sensible way that isn't already being done by other things in a much more effective way. So, and it's currently not allowed. So, so the National Academy Committee made a list of 10 criteria. You've got to meet all of these 
and have a, a, an expert committee approve it. I put it all on one slide here. Um, if you want to do this. We didn't say you can't do it. We said you can't do it now without meeting all of these, which you can't meet right now. The Chinese scientist, her, depends which way you score these things. He met either one or at best 50% of these things. It would not have been allowed here. People ask, why didn't people who thought or knew that he was doing this turn him in? Because he was in China. It wasn't so easy. But if he'd been doing this here, somebody would have turned him in. It would have been stopped. I'm, I'm certain that's true. But we still have to worry about this question of rogue scientists. How do we stop that internationally? You probably know there's this phenomenon called stem cell tourism where something that's banned here because it doesn't work or is completely bogus, it still happens here to some extent, but people go to Romania or Ukraine or other places to have things done that wouldn't be allowed here. How do we stop that sort of thing? So I picked those because they're all known to be cases where it's done. I'm not maligning those countries in particular. So. Okay, so I'm going to stop. I ran over more than I meant to, but...